I was just amazed at how God used that man. You know, the Bible tells us here in 2 Chronicles chapter number 1 that God, when he came to, uh, Sam, or when he came rather to Solomon, he said, I'm going to give you one wish, something, what would you like? And I don't know about you, but if I had one wish in this world, I don't know that I would pick what Solomon picked. I remember in January, if you remember back in the day, I was driving down the road in a, in a state, I can't remember, maybe it was Connecticut, New York, where they allow billboards, and uh, we were coming back from Christmas, and the uh, Powerball jackpot was getting close to $1 billion. Uh, remember that back in January? And, you know, I don't do the lottery or anything like that, but I was just for a few moments as we're driving down the road, just daydreaming, uh, just for a few moments, what would I do if I had a billion dollars? You know, and I think I could be content with 100 million, somewhere around there. I, I don't think I need a whole $1 billion to be content in life. But what would you do if you had been given one wish by God? And you know, as I was thinking about this and it being Father's Day today, uh, God just really began to work on my heart. And I would like to share a few things from the life of Solomon regarding what makes a good dad. Solomon was a very wise man. He is called the wisest man who ever lived, but he was a very foolish father. And if you want to look for an example of a bad dad in the Word of God, you don't have to look too far. You have the life of Eli, and he raised two rebels. The life of Samuel, the life of Saul, the life of David, the life of Moses. They weren't too good of dads as far as what the Bible records, what they did and what they accomplished. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, and yet even though he was wise, he was a very foolish dad. And I believe the best example in the Word of God how not to raise your children is found in the life of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and yet he was the most foolish father who ever lived. Here's why he was the most foolish father. We'll see that this morning. He never prepared his children for their spiritual journey with God. And this morning from 2 Chronicles chapter 1, I'd like us to begin looking at verse number 7, and then we're going to go through several passages of Scripture this morning, looking at the life of Solomon. And I'd like us to see the mistakes that Solomon, Solomon made in his life, and then if we are wise this morning, whether you're a dad, a grandfather, a mother, or a grandmother, or maybe just aspire to be a dad or a mom one day, if we are wise this morning, we will glean these principles and apply them to our life and not make the same mistakes that Solomon made. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7. And that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to resign, uh, uh, rather reign in this stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Here's his answer. All right? God says, Whatever you want, Solomon, you can have. Verse 10. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? Can you imagine being granted one wish by God? What would it be? God says, Solomon, one request. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. Now, if you could sum up Solomon's life in one simple sentence, it would simply be this. He was a man who tried it all, and he was a man, secondly, who had it all. A man who tried it all and a man who had it all. He had it all. He had wealth. He had fame. He had a powerful kingdom. He had much, much more. I, I told us on a church on Wednesday night, his personal residence. It took him seven years to build the beautiful temple. Solomon's temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Seven years to complete the construction. On, I think it took us three months to build out the church building. But seven years to build the ornate temple that God had called him to do. It took them 14 years to construct Solomon's personal residence. It was called the House of the Forest of Lebanon because of these massive pillars that were on the inside and the outside. It, it's, it smelled like a, a cedar, uh, cedar closet in the entire house. It was overlaid with gold. It was one of the most beautiful things that you've ever seen. What, what's the fanciest house you've ever been to or you've seen? I've had the privilege of traveling up and down the coast of Rhode Island. Maybe some of you have seen the mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. That's a beautiful drive. I've been to Biltmore Estate there, and I've never been inside, but I've been on the grounds of the Biltmore Estate. Those are some beautiful places in the world, that the creations that man has made. But I would argue this morning that a guest room in the Biltmore house would pale in comparison to the beautiful palace that Solomon built for his personal residence. The Bible tells us in Chronicles that Solomon's tastes were so expensive that every single person that came into his house and ate a meal at Solomon's place 
had a plate that was made out of solid gold and the utensils were made out of solid gold as well. Every year the Bible says that ships would arrive from other parts of the world and it would bring gold and silver and ivory and peacocks and monkeys and just all the other exotic things from other parts of the world. Now, with that being said, Solomon asked for wisdom and he built, built a beautiful temple for God and a beautiful personal palace. But I want you to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse number 22. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse number 22. Flip over a couple of pages there. God says in his word there, the king Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and raiment and, and harness and spices and horses and mules at a, a, a rate year by year. Okay, so Solomon had all of these gifts coming in from all around the world because people recognized that he had a unique talent and a unique gift from God. and They wanted to be on the side of the wisest man in the world. Not a bad idea, right? You want to be on Solomon's side, you want to be on God's side of things. But the Bible tells us that they had so many horses coming in. Look at verse number 25. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the chariot cities with the king of Jerusalem. All right, he had so many horses and so many chariots, he had to build entire houses for them to live in. When we were in Arizona this past winter for some treatment for Liz, we, we met a lady at the clinic there who was coming in for treatment on a daily basis, and she and her husband raised Arabian horses. And they had about a 20-acre Arabian horse farm there in uh, Scottsdale, and I don't know anything about horses, but I do know that Arabian horses are some of the most beautiful creatures that I've ever seen. And we were able to go to the Arabian horse show, and after we went to that and saw the beautiful performances by her riders, she invited us over to her house. And we went to their home, their, their horse farm there, and I say the, use the word farm, uh, I guess in quotation marks, because the place that they had built there was a multi-million dollar, st uh, the stable itself cost millions and millions of dollars. Their, their one champion uh, mare, the one that they breed out, and the one that was worth almost a million dollars, that's what she said. Um, when we walked in and we saw his stable where he was living, it was nicer than probably most everyone's master bathrooms here. I mean, there was tile on the wall, and the, the floors were just immaculately clean, and he had running water. I mean, it was just the horse stable itself for this mare was amazing. And, and the amount of money that people will pour into a horse, look, they're beautiful creatures. I just don't understand it. But they're beautiful creatures, and Solomon, that stable in Scottsdale, Arizona, would pale in comparison to what Solomon would have built for the best Arabian horses that he would have had there in his stables. The Bible tells us that he had so many horses and chariots, he had to build entire cities for them. But look at verse number 27. And the king made silver in Jerusalem as stones. Can you imagine? Silver was just as common as rocks in Jerusalem. Now, with your finger here in 2 Chronicles, because we're going to come back to this book, would you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2? All right, Ecclesiastes was a book that was authored either by Solomon or about Solomon. And uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and writing about his life, Solomon says this in verse number 4. He says, I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water with with the wood that bringeth forth the trees. I got me servants and maidens, and I had servants born in my house. Also had great possessions, great and small, cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings in the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men, as musical instruments, that of all sorts. Verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. If you could sum up the life of King Solomon, it would be this. He had an incredibly blessed life and he held absolutely nothing back. Not only did he have it all, but secondly, Solomon, he tried it all. Recreation, pleasures, business, sports, anything that thrilled his heart, that, that his heart desired, he would go after it. This past April, I read about a man in England that for his 100th birthday, he decided for the first time in his life to parachute out of a plane. And so for his 100th birthday, he jumped out from 10,000 feet, and the news were there because it was a pretty big event. I couldn't imagine. I don't think my wife would let me, if I lived to be 100 years old, jump out of an airplane at, at age 100. But as he landed there, the news media said, now what's your next big thing? And he said, I jumped out of the airplane from 10,000 feet at age 100. For my 101st birthday, I want to jump out from 11,000 feet. 
Well, I don't know about that guy. He's kind of nuts. But, you know, Solomon, if he had opportunities like that, he would have done it. If there were extreme sports in Solomon's day, he would have been right in the middle of it. That's why he could write in the book of Ecclesiastes later on that whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, right? He's not somebody that would take an approach to life lackadaisically. Hey, what come, you know, let come what may, just whatever happens. No, he would be the guy that you're playing racquetball with, you're playing baseball or whatever sport you're with, and he is the most intense person on that field, and he is going to accomplish that goal no matter what. Solomon had it all. He had tried it all, but there was a large glaring problem in his life. And beloved, it does not end well for the wisest man who ever lived. Because in a sense, even though he was the wisest man, he was the world's most foolish father. One author put it this way. He said, in this world, there are two tragedies. One is getting what you want, and the other is not getting it. The old saying goes, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And Solomon, as a middle-aged man, stopped depending upon the Lord, and he trusted in his own wisdom and in his own strength. And as soon as he stopped trusting in the God of the Bible, his life began to fall apart very quickly. Remember that grand temple that he built to God? Well, that grand temple quickly became overshadowed by the other temples that he built for his wives. All his pagan wives moved in and they saw this temple to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they said, well, Solomon, dear, that's not fair. We want a temple for our God. And so Solomon, to pacify his wives, he would build temples for them. In fact, when the temple of God was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, history tells us that some of the temples that Solomon built for his, for his wives survived up to 300 years beyond the destruction of God's temple in Jerusalem. So Solomon was one man who came to the throne in wisdom, and he wrote the book of Proverbs early on in his life, and he, and he was used by God in a tremendous way, but unfortunately, his reign became known as the reign of folly because he did not pass along the wisdom to his son. Now, the question that I want every dad here today, every grandpa here today, even every mom or every grandmother here today is simply to ask this. Why did this happen? Why did Solomon lose his children? Why would Solomon, the next guy up, Rehoboam, his son, he would not learn from his father and read the Proverbs that Solomon had written but, but Rehoboam would go on to, to basically destroy the kingdom and it would be split in half and Solomon's legacy would be forever tarnished. Why did this happen to the wisest man that ever lived? And maybe more importantly, how do we avoid failure like Solomon? Well, there's a couple of principles that I think we find in God's word. That, no, in fact, not think. I know we find in God's word that I'd like you to understand this morning. First of all, there are two things, two godly things that a godly parent is convinced of. Number one, a godly dad is convinced that spiritually leading at home is more important than success in this world. Those are, these are men who would say, you know, my walk with God, my, my family's walk with God is more important than how big my kingdom gets in the corporate world here in America. My, my, spiritual, my family's spiritual fitness, so to speak, is more important than my time at the gym. My family's walk with God is the most important thing. But it's so sad that today, many dads, even those, some of us that may be here this morning, they value material possession for their children greater than they value their spiritual direction. If you were to ask the average dad in America or maybe in Loudoun County today, are you providing for your children? The dad would look at you and say, are you kidding me? I mean, I worked 60, 70 hours last week. I was up from the crack of, you know, from the, from the first, from the crack of dawn until way past sunset providing for my children. I give them the best baby furniture. I, I make sure I buy organic diapers or whatever it might be. I take care of my kids. Only the best for my children. And while you may be providing financially for them, and Solomon no doubt provided financially for Rehoboam, right? Fatherhood is much more than simply providing money for your children and putting clothes on their back and for helping them with homework. Fatherhood is much more than just teaching your children how to handle finances, even though that's important. It's much more important than teaching your children how to stay out of jail. Fatherhood is teaching your children to have wisdom. And hear me this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Wisdom, if it could be caught, Rehoboam would have been the second wisest person ever to live. But wisdom is not something that can be caught. Wisdom is something that must be taught. We well, say, what is wisdom? Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective and then applying the Bible to everyday life. Do you think the average dad in our Christian churches today 
in your neighborhoods, do you think the average dad walks in wisdom with his family? Well, earlier on in his life, Solomon had written in Proverbs, Proverbs 23, 15, My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice. So he says, son, if you're a wise child, if you're a wise son, I'm going to be happy. And if those of you who have children that are out of the house that are walking with God, you probably can echo that. I am so thankful, my reign, I am happy in my heart because my children are walking with God. He says in verse number 24, Proverbs 23, 24, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Listen, Dad, the conversation that you should have with your children, even from an early age, should be like, you know, Dad, I think I want to be a doctor when I grow up. Okay, son, that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing to shoot for. But are you going to be a, a doctor that is wise? Is being a doctor what God wants you to do? You know, Dad, I think God wants me to be a teacher. Okay, well, that's wonderful, daughter, but is that what God wants you to do? Are you going to be a wise mechanic? Are you going to be a wise firefighter? Are you going to be a wise... It changes every day in our house pretty much, but from an early age on, we want to teach our children to do what God wants them to do and not what they want to do, and not only that, but to be wise in how they do it. Proverbs 24, 13, I will rejoice when my children do what is right. You know, Solomon takes his son, and he shows them through the book of Proverbs, if you do what is right, God will bless your life. You know, many, many parents today teach their children how to change the oil, and that's important. How to mow the grass, and that's important. How to make sure you don't bounce a check, that's important. And if they say, if we can get that down, then we'll have a future for our children. But dad, the best education that money can buy in this country is not a foundation for life that matters. An education without instruction in the wisdom of God will only make your children intelligent failures in life. I want you to listen to this. Uh, it's a quote, a rather lengthy quote from a commentator. It says this, Since 1955, knowledge has doubled every five years. Libraries grown with the weight of new books. In fact, our generation possesses more data about the universe and human personality than all previous generations put together. High school graduates today have been exposed to more information about the world, get this, than Plato, Aristotle, and Benjamin Franklin put together. In terms of facts alone, neither Moses or the Apostle Paul could pass a college entrance exam today. But by everyone's standards, even with our knowledge, society today is populated with a bumper crop of brilliant failures. Men and women educated to earn a living who do not know anything about handling life itself. He says, let's face it. Knowledge is not enough to meet life's problem. We need wisdom, which helps us encounter life with godly skill. If you could learn wisdom by reading a book, Rehoboam, would have, all he would have had to do is read the book of Proverbs. Maybe Solomon, like many dads today, you know, pat themselves on the back thinking, hey, because I live at the same address as my son, he's going to turn out okay for God. But listen, even if you share the same home with your children, which is getting fewer and fewer today, but even if you live at the same geographic location today, according to some research done by the Family Research Council, the average dad spends eight minutes a day talking to his children. The former U.S. Attorney General, William Barr, said, um, he said, if you, if you take a look at the one factor that most closely correlates with crime, it's not poverty, it's not unemployment, it's not education or the lack thereof, it's the absence of the father in the family. And now for over 40, almost 50 years now, the feminist agenda has been saying that men are overrated and men are not necessary. And the data is starting to pull, come in now very quickly. And we understand that w without a dad in the home leading and guiding the family spiritually, boy, the family is going to fall apart. And, and I'm so thankful that God knew what he was doing when he said, Dad, you have an awesome responsibility for setting a moral and a spiritual example in the home to guide the family and to lead them, not to come home and sit on the lazy boy and flip through the TV channels when you get back after a hard day's worth of work, but to invest in the lives of your children. You know, the Southern Baptist Convention did a, a research back in 2003, and they found that if a child was the first person in their house to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability that the rest of the house would be saved. So if little, my, my son or daughter was the first one to get saved, 3.5% likelihood that everyone else would trust Christ. If the mom was the first one to trust Christ, the percentage goes up to 17%. But get this, if the father is the first one to place his faith in Christ, 93% of all households follow his conversion to Jesus Christ. Can I ask you fathers this morning something? 
if your teenager's love for the Word of God and his love for serving in the church was a reflection of your love for the Bible and your love for this church, what kind of Christian would you have on your hands? In our culture today, there is so much confusion and the devasta- about morality, and there's this devastating results of the, the sexual revolution that are literally destroying our country. Hey, who is there better to teach our children about the value of fidelity and the art of marriage than the example of a father who has chosen to love his wife and to be with the mother of his, of, of his children and remain faithful to her for all of his life? Who better to teach that no matter what the world says about you, your wife and your children know what is most important to you. The godly father is more concerned about the spiritual success of his home than succeeding in the world. But there's a second thought I want to bring to you today. Number one, he's concerned about the spiritual success in the home. But secondly, a godly father uh, being an, is, is an example uh, of instruction or is an example of wisdom rather than just simply giving it. That's where Solomon failed. He was giving instruction. He was very prolific in his ability to write with pen and paper. But where Solomon Solomon ultimately failed is, is, is he didn't listen to his own Proverbs. He became that immoral man that he warned against in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs that he wrote about. Rehoboam, he saw what was happening firsthand, and he looked and he saw his dad being immoral. You know, when God said in the Bible that they're not to bring pagan women into the into their homes. Solomon said, you know, it's okay, I'm the king, I can have this double standard. And so Rehoboam saw the law of God that said, thou shalt not, but Solomon, his dad, said, oh, it's okay for me, I'm the king, and so he did. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus specifically that they were not to gather horses or silver or gold from Egypt. Well, in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse number 28, it says that they were importing horses from Egypt. Very, I mean, exactly contradictory to what God said. And so when God said, thou shalt not, Solomon said, it's okay for me because I'm the king. And when Rehoboam saw what his daddy was doing, he essentially was saying, if my daddy doesn't care about obeying God, then why should I? You know, some people think, well, if I just have a Bible in the car seat, it's going to be good enough for my kids, right? As long as I've got a, a Bible on my coffee table, or in the, in the case of the Oliveruses, on, on their soda table, if, as long as i got a Bible on my coffee table, I'm going to be good to go. Not so, dad and mom. Your kids want to know whether or not you truly believe and you buy what the Bible teaches. It's one thing to drag your kids to church on Sunday morning, but it's another thing Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday to live the truths of God's word. A godly father, number one, knows that the spiritual success of his home is more important than the success of his kingdom. Secondly, a godly father knows that being an example is better than simply giving instruction. So, Dad, can I ask you this morning, do you desire to shepherd your family? If so, if you say, yes, I want to lead them and I want to guide them and I want them to be successful spiritually, okay, can I just give you a couple of thoughts this morning from the Word of God? Number one, it's not too late to start shepherding your family. It's never too late to start shepherding your family. Begin with your own personal relationship with Jesus. You say, okay, where do I stand? I want my kids to turn out serving God. That's great. But what about you? What do I need to change? Say, well, I don't know what I need to change. Okay, can I ask you this question, Dad? What in your life would you never want your children to find out about? What secret habit do you have, secret sin that you go to that you never want your children to find out about? That's a very good place to start. Start confessing your sin to God. Ask Him to forgive you. Start with your personal relationship with Him. It's never too late to start. And by the way, this includes whether your children are in the home or they're out and about and they're gone. Your children still need godly counsel from their dad. Godly grandfathers are needed too. It's never too late to start. But there's one more word of encouragement for the dads here today who said, I want to I shepherd my family. I want to guide my family. I want to leave this with you this morning. Secondly, it's always too early to quit. Always too early to quit. Some of you, I know your story. And you're daily pursuing God's face and praying that God would change the direction of your son or your daughter that's wayward, that's not walking with the Lord. And you're constantly begging God to do a work in their life and you see little or no fruit. And sometimes you feel like throwing in the towel and saying, it's not worth it. Can I encourage you this morning, dad and mom, don't give up, don't quit, stay the course, don't abandon the shepherd's staff and the shepherd's rod, no matter how ineffective your leadership may seem. 
you do not know when God is going to begin a work in that child's heart and what it will take, so keep pressing on. You know, sometimes we think that we're the only ones that are stuck in our situation. We're, sometimes we think we're the only ones that have a wayward child. There was a preacher back in the 1880s, and he had a son that completely rejected Christ. And so growing up in a pastor's home, this son became an atheist. And his dad was at his wit's end. He said, I don't know what to do with you, son. And so he said, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I want you to apply for one year to a Bible college. And if you'll go to Bible college for one year, then I'll help you out with your education after that. But I want you to go to Bible college for one year. So he had him fill out an application for Moody Bible Institute. And that a, was a, preach, a preacher school back, back in the 1880s, especially that was a powerhouse and turned out some great preachers. Was the kind of the product of D.L. Moody's uh, evangelistic efforts. And so he filled out the application. On that application form, it, it very clearly asked you, are you a Christian? Have you ever been saved? And the guy, honestly, that teenager, the rebellious son, honestly filled it out and said, no, I'm not a Christian. Well, because of that, they rejected him from this preacher school, right? If you're not, why are we going to train you to be a preacher of the word of God if you're not a Christian? So he got that rejection letter, and his dad, they didn't have the phone back then, but his dad wrote a pleading letter to the president of that college, Dr. R.A. Torrey. And he said, sir, would you please reconsider? And it was such a moving and a pleading letter of a, a father that was praying for the heart of his son that Dr. Torrey, when he got that letter, he said, okay, I will reconsider as long as two conditions are met. Number one, your son has to meet with me every single day before the day gets started in my office for prayer. And then secondly, your son must obey every one of the rules. The first time he disobeys even one of the rules, he's going to be kicked out of the school. Well, that boy agreed to that because he wanted his dad's blessing and he wanted his dad to pay for his future education, so he agreed to go. And every single day, like clockwork, at 6 a.m., this, this boy would meet with Dr. R.A. Torrey, a great preacher of yesteryear, and they would meet in their office, and this boy would bring in his questions, and he would bring in his doubts, and he would bring in his arguments, and Dr. Torrey would answer every one of those arguments from the Word of God. And then one day, towards the end of the last semester there of the spring, um, Torrey tells the story, he says, one day he came in, that, that boy William came into the office, and his face was completely changed. It, it was like, uh, what, he said it was like the rain on parched ground completely different appearance because this boy had trusted Jesus Christ as his savior and William R. Newell that 18 year old rebellious atheist boy who trusted Christ as his savior went on not only to become a great preacher and a famous author but he eventually became the president of that very Bible college that Dr. Torrey was the president of and towards the end of his life he sat down with pen and paper and he wrote a poem that summarizes compares and contrasts his life before Jesus Christ. The words of his poem go like this. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Anybody recognize that song? Hey, we sang that this morning. Hopefully you're paying attention. I love the last verse of this song. If we have the words up there on the screen, I think we got those up there for us, right? Now I've given to Jesus everything. Oh, I guess that's not the right, right words up there, but it goes like this. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a great contrast between the soul of someone who does not know Jesus Christ and the soul of someone that has been gloriously saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the greatest desire of William's, uh, William Newell's father was that his son would come to know Christ as his Savior and walk with Jesus. Dads, this morning, is that your one wish? That your children would walk with God? If you had one wish this morning, what would it be? Maybe for the dads here this morning, it would go something like this. That we as fathers would walk in wisdom. And see God incorporate biblical wisdom into the lives and into the hearts of our children. Because to hear God say to you one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant, is one thing. But as a dad, I long to hear God say to my children, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I can train them, I can teach them, and ultimately your responsibility lies in the individual heart of every child. But ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls here today, please understand, God has given each of us the responsibility not only to pray for the next generation, but to invest our lives in them. So dad and mom, boys and girls, it doesn't matter who you are today, 
God calls us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to make disciples of Jesus. And that disciple-making process is not over in someone's life until they take their last breath. It's not something that we start when someone trusts Christ as their Savior. No, it is an ongoing day-by-day work. And Dad, that discipleship process is your responsibility. And so if you're here today and you're not investing spiritually in the life of your children, Dad, can I, can I encourage you to do that? And maybe you're here this morning and you say, I have been, you know, from time to time we have family devotions and we read the Bible together, but I'm just not doing the job that I know God wants me to be doing. Then can I just encourage you, it's never too late to start, but it's always too late to quit. Never want to stop giving up on what God has called you to do. If your children turn out to serve God, if they have a heart for God and love God, what greater treasure could there be in all of the world than to hear God say to your children one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the prayer for my kids, and I hope, dads, that's the prayer for your children as well. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the example of Solomon in your word. Maybe not how to uh, be a father, but how not to be a father. Lord, I think every dad here today is really good at providing financially for their children. We've given them a home to live in. We've given them the clothes on their backs. We've taken care of their physical needs, but Father, they have a much greater need than that, and that's a spiritual need to walk with God. Lord, maybe there's a dad here today who does not know you as their Savior. I pray today that they would get saved, that they would understand that you love them, that you died on the cross for their sins, and before they can ever attempt to lead their family spiritually, first of all, they need to be led to you personally. And so if they've never been saved today, I pray, Lord, that they would trust you as their Savior. And for the Christian dad who is here today, who is discouraged, I pray that this morning you would encourage them never to give up, to keep praying, to keep pressing on, because, Lord, we do not know when you're going to move and when you're going to act, but we just have to leave it with you and trust you that you're going to do great and mighty things. Lord, I thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives, and I ask you this morning that as we continue our time now, this invitation, that you would help us to respond to the words that you've given to us from the Bible this morning. Our heads are bowed this morning, our eyes are closed, and as Sarah softly plays the piano, if God has spoken to your heart today, and you need to make a decision for Christ, Dad, Grandpa, to invest more spiritually in the life of your children, would you commit that to God this morning? If God said, what's your one wish? Would you this morning, Dad, say, God, my wish is that I would walk in wisdom and see my children live lives pleasing to Jesus Christ? If there's someone here today who does not know Jesus as their Savior, the good news of the Bible is that God loves you. God loved me, even though I was a wicked sinner, and I spat in his face time and time again. And even though I was a sinner, God loved me, and he sent his son to die on the cross for my sin. And the Bible says in John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today, my friend, you can be saved from your sins. And you can lead your family to grow in a closer relationship with the Lord. If you've never made that your decision, if you've never asked Jesus to save you, would you do that this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed? As Sarah plays the piano, if God has spoken to your heart, would you take care of business with the Lord this morning?